support me on Patreon so I can keep my lights on. If you decide to recreate anything, it is at your own risk, and I do not accept the responsibility. Oh, hi. Thanks for checking in. I'm still a piece of garbage. What's up, kings and queens? Lately, my experiments have been failing, and it kind of feels like I'm going against Goku right now. I needed something to go right, just so I can get my narcissism to go back up, so we're going to extract heptane and diethyl ether from starting fluid. We're going to use the 50% ether starting fluid just because we can get a lot more out of it compared to the 20% one. Initially, we're going to put everything into a round bottom boiling flask because we are going to distill all of the ether and heptane over once we're done. I start off by using a funnel, but this turned out to be quite a bad idea as there was a lot lost when I kept spraying. I also put a different attachment onto the round bottom boiling flask as it reduced the amount lost. And also the obvious, make sure you do this in a well ventilated area, or like I did, I went outside to put everything into the flask. It is recommended that you put the starting fluid into the freezer, as that will help a lot. Once everything was defrosted, I set up for a simple distillation. I did a simple distillation, however a fractional distillation would probably be a better idea, as you can get a little bit more of a pure product when you do that. Though I was going to extract a little bit more, so I'm just going to fractionally distill my entire lot when the time comes. When you initially start to heat up your mixture, you'll see some bubbling come out of it, and that's just off-gassing from the dissolved gases into the solution. This will bring some diethyl ether over, so don't be afraid if anything starts to come over right away. Here you can see some ether that came over, and it is below its boiling point, so it might be confusing when you first see it. Ether boils at a temperature of about 35 degrees Celsius, and you're going to collect everything up until about 70 degrees Celsius. Here you can see me switch out the flask at ether's boiling point, but you really do not need to do this. I am just a paranoid person, and I just wanted everything at the boiling point because I like to be a perfectionist. Though I did end up putting everything back into my total ether solution because then I kind of realized I'm kind of being stupid right now. Speaking of stupid, you can see that in the next clip I'm on my phone trying to message all the baddies online and there is a huge increase in pressure into the flask. This is because I forgot to attach my water pump to my condenser and everything was starting to go haywire. You can see in the reflection that I came by to attach the water pump to the condenser. I guess the girls online will have to wait. Here, after I turn on the water pump, you can see that everything has come over nice and pretty relatively fast. It's extremely important to make sure that you're in a well ventilated area or under a fume hood just because the flammable ether vapors will come out when you do this. It is also recommended that you put your receiving flask in a ice bath just so you can reduce the amount of ether that comes out because it is pretty volatile. So just make sure you do that or if you're in a really, really cold area, that can also work too. You can see that the ether comes over quite quickly, and we're actually near the end of the ether section of the starting fluid. You'll see as you close in on the ether section that the temperature will start to rise up, and the flask won't boil as viciously. This is a sign that you're kind of in the middle ground and your heptane will be distilling over soon. The second that the temperature reaches 70 degrees Celsius, we are going to switch the flask, and you can also see that the boiling flask is boiling. You're essentially going to collect everything up to about 98 degrees Celsius, and this is going to contain the straight chain heptane and the branch chain heptane. If you're interested to know what straight chain and branch chain heptane is, is they're essentially constitutional isomers. And constitutional isomers are essentially the same molecule, they just have different bonding rearrangements, and they just look different. Once it went past 98 degrees Celsius, I stopped the distillation, and this is what we have left in the boiling flask. From the two cans of the starting fluid, you can see that we actually got a pretty good amount of heptane and diethyl ether. On the right is our diethyl ether, and on the left is our heptane. There's no point to really say how much I got, as there's a huge range in the ether content and the heptane content, so I really can't say if it was a good yield or not. Though this is a really good way to get heptane and diethyl ether, as it's pretty cheap to get the starting fluid, and I think it's only about like $3 at your local Walmart. As you've been seeing me pour this in, this is the ether. Now, ether is very important that you wrap in Teflon tape and make sure that it lids on tight. You're also going to want to store it over sodium metal or sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. I will go over the reason why you need to store it over that in just a minute. What you see me pouring in now is the heptane, and we're going to wrap this in Teflon tape. I just don't show it on camera. This doesn't have any special storage situations like with the ether, and it can just be capped. Now back to why ether must be stored over sodium metal or sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. Ethers are quite notorious for forming peroxides and sometimes within 8 days they form them. Let's see how that happens. 
Diethyl ether hydroperoxide can be formed by the photooxygenation of diethyl ether. This is a radical process driven by UV excitation of molecular oxygen into a more reactive form. It's an extremely undesirable product as it has a pretty high risk of explosion. It's very sensitive and quite scary. Here's a picture of a slight safety concern. All you gotta do to make it go away is you just shake it and... <laughs> This is normally why it's stored over sodium, sodium hydroxide, or potassium hydroxide, just because it can stop the peroxide formation and really keep you safe. So what I'm going to do is use some of the heptane that I made, and I'm going to wash off the sodium metal that was being stored in mineral oil. Heptane is a very good use of this, and that's partial the reason why I got some. Once all of the oil is dissolved into the heptane, we're going to dry off the sodium, cut a small piece, and we're going to put that into the diethyl ether. The benefit of using the sodium metal is it's a very good drying agent for diethyl ether. Now, there shouldn't be a huge amount of water into the diethyl ether, but it still is a good idea to drop it in and to, again, stop the peroxide formation and keep you safe. This will also make sodium hydroxide, which is, again, also used in the peroxide inhibition. Just make sure to note that it does release hydrogen gas, so you will have to burp your jar occasionally as it is, you know, forming the sodium hydroxide and releasing the hydrogen gas. Though the best way is to just keep it into the cans as it's sealed, it's kept away from moisture and oxygen, and there's just CO2 in the can. A good idea would just be to extract when you need it and just do it in small batches. Here, after the addition of the sodium metal, you can see that we actually have a slight reaction in the jar. You can see that a little bit of hydrogen gas is being released as there was some residual water in the diethyl ether. It only reacted for a little bit and eventually no more bubbling happened and it was safe to store. Please subscribe as it keeps me going and it keeps me motivated and I thank every single one of you for doing that.